Thank you. So what Mika did not say is that uh, 2007, that presentation was supposed to be a demo. Right? So imagine giving a five-minute demo with no demo. It was interesting. Uh, and then Jim, I was a bit dispirited after his inspiring talk. It was incredible. And they just announced today, Nation Builder, they are leading a round or had a round led by Omidyar Network, which also is now an investor in Change.org. So awesome to be a part of that community. So I want to talk about how the way social movements are being built is changing. I'm actually going to start it with an example in the U.S. So about 13 years ago, uh, the Boy Scouts of America fought all the way to the Supreme Court to defend their right to discriminate against gay members, and they won. This ruling virtually stopped all debate on this issue for more than a decade. Uh, and as early as last year, few people thought change on this issue was, was possible in the foreseeable future until a remarkable, unlikely hero emerged, Jennifer Tyrell. So Jen is a 32-year-old mother who uh, is from Ohio, and her seven-year-old Cruz was a Cub Scout. And she was a den mother until she was kicked out of the Scouts last year because she's a lesbian. And this wasn't exceptional. This had been happening for decades, gay troops and leaders being kicked out. And most people walked away, but Jen decided to stand up and do something about it. And she started a change work petition asking the Boy Scouts of America to change their anti-gay policy. And she got 300,000 people to join her. And with the support of the pro-equality organization, GLAAD, she was able to spark a national conversation on the issue. She appeared with her son on CNN, ABC, CBS, and Fox. And subsequent to that, she delivered the petition in a national way in front of the conference they have every single year in May. But the Boy Scouts didn't budge. They didn't do anything. In fact, they reaffirmed the policy they had before. And most people thought that was the end. But for Jen, it was just the beginning. She decided to look at the Boy Scouts board and notice that their two Fortune 500 CEOs of gay-friendly companies, Ernst & Young and AT&T. And she petitioned them to denounce the anti-gay policy or resign. And six hours and 600 signatures later, the CEO of Ernst & Young became the first board member in the history of the Boy Scouts to publicly come out against the anti-gay policy. And three days later, so did the CEO of AT&T. Inspired by this campaign, Eagle Scout Zach Walls decides to start a petition after finding out the largest corporate donor of the Boy Scouts, Intel, was supporting the organization. And after 30,000 signatures, he too won. And decides then, inspired to start a second campaign. That second campaign targets UPS. And UPS also, after being petitioned, stopped all of its donations. And starts to kick off campaigns around the country, more than 100, oftentimes from scouts, oftentimes trying to petition their troop leaders to come in against the policy. And one was started by the mother of Ryan Andreessen. So Ryan is a 17-year-old who had just finished his Eagle Scout project, right, building a tolerance wall for his middle school. And in response, the scouts denied him his troop Eagle Scout because he's gay. So more than... 400,000 people joined him, and his mom ended up going on Ellen with him, and national exposure spreads across all mainstream media, and in response, the California Boy Scouts decide to reverse the policy in direct defiance of the national organization. And what happened then is all this online energy turned to offline organizing as well, and Zach Walls decides to start an organization called Scouts for Equality out of this movement, and organizes people online to go off to volunteer for face-to-face interaction with more than 200 local then troops. And after 13 months of campaigning, right, and 13 years after the Boy Scouts fought all the way to the Supreme Court to defend this policy, the unthinkable happened. The Boy Scouts of America just two weeks ago voted to allow gay troops for the first time. Thank you. It's an amazing, amazing picture. So this is in no small part, this entire thing, because one woman, Jennifer Tyrell, decided to stand up. And then Zach Walls stood up with her. And then 1.8 million people around the country stood in support. And their fight is not over, because the National Scouts voted in gay troops, but not gay leaders. And this is a huge step forward, and it opens the door for full equality soon. So tell this story not just because it's remarkable and inspiring, because I think this is a sign of what's to come 
in change-making around the world. This campaign looks fundamentally different than traditional national organizing campaigns from many organizations. And it's those differences are why it was so successful. And I want to highlight two of them in particular that we think are remarkably compelling. The first is this campaign was not about policy arguments. It was about personal stories. So consider two different ways of framing this issue, this campaign. First is the question of whether a private organization should be legally required to accept gay members despite their religious objections. The second is whether 17-year-old Ryan Andreessen should be kicked out of the Boy Scouts simply because he is gay. These are almost the same question, but they feel dramatically different, and it's because of that that the the public responded so much dramatically different to his campaign. It didn't just make it more persuasive. It inspired incredible support, passionate believers who then spread this like wildfire across the media, changing the public narrative and the way the issue was perceived. Now, organizations have known the power of personal stories for a long time. But they haven't rarely, only rarely, deployed these in most issue advocacy campaigns. And part of the reason for that is because it's difficult to surface really compelling personal stories. But that's changed forever. Because it's easier for anyone to use simple online tools that are impacted by issues to stand up and to speak out with their own voice, turning abstract issues into compelling personal stories, and illuminating how policy impacts real people's lives. The second big shift we've seen in this campaign and many others is unlike traditional large national campaigns, this was defined by a shift between big and many small campaigns. Had Jen stopped her campaign after the first national petition, like many organizations might have, the the Boy Scouts never would have budged, never would have changed. Cracks only started to appear when she and others set their sights on smaller, more specific, focused, and achievable campaigns in rapid succession, petitioning board members and corporate donors and local troop leaders across the country. And this, too, isn't dramatically new, in that local community organizers have known for a long time the power of these distributed small campaigns. But historically, it's been really difficult to do this at scale, in large numbers. And now it is easier than ever before. And as a result of this, right, as a result of these these two shifts of policy arguments to personal stories, of big to small, we see a remarkable new opportunity for citizen power around the world. And we see this every single day in the more than 18 countries in which we now have staff. Just recently in Brazil, there's a piece of legislation proposed to weaken anti-corruption investigators. And in response, more than 1,000 citizen petitions started targeting individual Congress members asking them to stand against the legislation. In India, there was a huge amount of national interest and outrage around bribery. The response now that's happening is people across the subcontinent are starting petitions around individuals who are asking for bribes in local communities. First one campaign, now hundreds of campaigns, soon thousands of campaigns. And in Turkey this week, in the wake of the violence, There are tons of citizen petitions started, hundreds of them, but not about big national revolution. It's about daily change, but many, many small issues that can change, that aggregate into large impact, things around police behavior, around media censorship, around the private use of public lands. And we see this, as I mentioned, everywhere we go, and we think that ultimately this is what's going to transform the way in which people turn big issues into small local campaigns that reverberate nationally in massive, massive quantity. So the question is, what does this mean for everyone else? What does this mean both for social movements and for the organizations that many of us here run? Well, now, the power shift that's happening between institutions and individuals is immense. It does not mean, by any means, that traditional organizations don't matter. On the contrary, in this example in the Boy Scouts, The organizations GLAAD and the Scouts for Equality were immensely important. They could not have won without their support. But the reason they were so effective is because they had the insight and the humility to realize that their role was best facilitating and supporting existing movements and letting people speak for themselves. And it was because of that rather unique approach that they had far more power than they otherwise would have had. 
And so we see this is where the future is going. We think the organizations that will have the most impact are those that are able to harness the potential power of millions of people around the world speaking with their own voice and organizing in their own communities, right? where organizations are supporters, not simply recruiting them. And the impact of all that, the results of this entire movement, we think, is going to mean that important issues that once seemed difficult to shift, issues like the ban on gay scouts, are now open game for change. Thank you.